I'd like to welcome everyone to this wonderful panel discussion. We're really thrilled to have such an illustrious panel of um, representatives from the distributors here. I'm Nancy Anderson. I'm the Associate Executive Director of SMI, and we're really excited about this discussion today. Um, before we get the discussion started, just a bit of housekeeping. All participants are on mute for the program today, and we'll be taking questions via the questions feature on Zoom. We will be taking questions um, in writing, and then Christine Dean with SMI will be sharing them with the panelists as we go along. So we encourage you to submit your questions, and as there's time, we will share them with the panelists as well. Um, any questions that we don't answer today, we will hope to get some answers and start discussion um, via uh, email or other formats and try to get some answers out to you after the program. So without further delay, because we have a lot to cover today and I want to make sure we maximize the value of this wonderful panel that we have gathered, um, I'd like to welcome our panelists for the discussion today. Uh, with us are Lisa Homan, who's the CEO of Concordance Healthcare Solutions, Rob Kalia, who is the VP of Government Affairs and Quality Assurance with Medline, Mark Zacker, who is the EVP Chief Commercial Officer for Owens & Minor, Jean Cavassini, who is the SVP and COO of McKesson Pharmaceutical Solutions and Services, Ty Ford, who is the Vice President of Sales for the Western U.S. with Henry Schein, and Rob, Robert Rajalingam, who is the President of U.S. Sales Medical Solutions for Cardinal Health. We're so pleased to have you all here today and really appreciate your taking the time to talk with our SMI members. Um, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to just take one quick minute to do an introduction of themselves. I've given you their title, but I'd like to give them the chance to give a little bit more background. Just take a minute um, and also to answer the initial question, which is, what is the one thing you hope our industry learns from this COVID-19 pandemic as we look to the next normal? So, Jean, I'd like to start with you. Um, if you can give us your background and what the one thing is that you hope our industry learns from this pandemic. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone. I've been with McKesson a little over 18 years, and I currently lead our drug distribution business. So I have responsibility for our distribution network, supply chain teams, as well as customer responsibility for health systems, community pharmacy, and provider. Um, I think that's a great question. And as I look back over the last six or seven months or so, I think we have seen the best of provider partners and manufacturers working together, focused on the shared mission of patient care. And when we collaborate with that singular focus, I think we can um, accomplish a lot and we've seen great progress. So that's a great learning for me. And I hope as we think about the new normal post COVID, that is something that we take forward and bring with us. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. Robert, what about you? Quick introduction and your thoughts on what we can learn. Absolutely. Thanks, Nancy. So uh, I've been at Cardinal Health almost three years now, about 20, a little over 20 years in the medical device and supply space. Uh, in my current role, oversee our acute, non-acute, and lab business at Cardinal Health, as well as our channel partners team, which is all of the organizations represented by my colleagues here on the panel, um, our GPO relationships, and our government business. Um, in terms of uh, a learning uh, or something that I think we would take as an industry, you know, in my opinion, good decisions are enabled by good information. And, and good information comes from well-organized data. So I think, you know, my hope would be as an industry that we continue to build a connective tissue, if you will, across stakeholders to communicate and share data effectively and appropriately uh, when the need arises, right? So then we can respond not as individuals, um, entities, but really as a collective group and something I've seen some progress on certainly over the last six to nine months as we've, we've built some of that. Wonderful, yeah, there's definitely been some acceleration of things we were looking to create um, as a result of the pandemic. Absolutely. Rob, turning to Thanks. you. Thanks, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Nancy said, my name is Rob Kalia. I am Medline's uh, VP of Government Affairs. I also am one of Medline's VPs of quality with responsibility over our kidding organization as well as our grape gown and uh, PPE business. So I've had a, a unique role throughout the pandemic, uh, both uh, being deeply rooted in uh, some of our core product divisions affected by uh, COVID-19, as well as our link between those business units and the government. So hopefully I'll be able to bring some of those perspectives to the panel. In terms of the one thing I've learned throughout COVID, and I hope we've learned, uh, is that 
will, we stay committed to supply chain diver diversification, that we don't put all of our eggs in any one basket and we work together collectively as an industry, manufacturers, distributors, uh, healthcare providers uh, to uh, maintain and ensure supply chain diversification and a renewed commitment to um, strategic stockpiling. Excellent. I think that's a great point. I think we've all learned that through this crisis. Mark, welcome. And if you could give us your intro. Yeah, thank you, Nancy, and, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Mark Zacker. I am, uh, as Nancy indicated, the Chief Commercial Officer with Owens & Minor. I joined in June of 2019, so uh, coming up on a year and a half or so. Before that, I was with Thermo Fisher Scientific for 15 years and the last uh, five years running their healthcare business, which is a diagnostics channel. Um, and, and so as I as I think about the, the one thing, it's Let's, we really need the pledge to store the events of, of the last nine months and, and the, the next, who knows, six to nine months in our long-term memory. You know, let's capture these learnings around continuity of supply, capture the learnings around the complexity of the supply chains in our industry, and, and, and just remember that. And, and the distribution um, uh, partners are here to really work with um, the manufacturers and the customers. And so let's make sure that we partner and have open and transparent dialogue and, and as Robert indicated, share data and just have a, a, a new level of relationship. That's a, an excellent point, thank you. And Ty, we're glad you're here. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm Ty Ford, I'm Vice President of Sales for the Western US with Henry Schein. I've been with Henry Schein for all 18 years of my career in distribution, um, located right outside of Austin, Texas in a little town called Wimberley. Um, you know, I. I I'd like to say there's a lot that we all learn, you know, throughout this COVID experience, you know, but I, I would certainly say, you know, for Henry Schein, it was the ability to be nimble, make quick decisions, pivot where necessary, and, and have clarity in doing so. Um, you know, as a national distributor, we rely heavily upon our supplier partners and the need for clarity and proper communication, as well as on the provider side, helping us to make informed decisions when necessary. And so it was, we had some great examples of where that occurred and could not have been able to come through in the ways which we in which we did without those partnerships. Yeah, we certainly um, believe in those partnerships here at SMI and are continuing to look for ways to strengthen collaboration and partnership with all of our members. So thank you. And Lisa? Hi, Nancy. Um, thank you. Thank you to the other panel participants. It's great to be here with everyone today. Uh, Lisa Hellman, CEO of Concordance Healthcare Solutions. Um, I've been with the organization for 20 years. Uh, took over as CEO in January of 19, so was able to be here a little bit before COVID happened. Um, but the thing I think, I, I agree with all the panelists, right? All of those things are important, and I think it all wraps up into strategic partnerships. And the need to have strategic partnerships and people that you can trust well before you need them. So when you know, you're going through a chaotic time or a stressful time or a pandemic or any of these such events, it's always good to have those relationships um, well vetted. You have a lot of trust in the relationship so that you can rely on those people to help, um, whether it's with data, whether it's with supply chain, whether it's understanding the market. Um, so I think it's all about having those strategic partnerships and developing those, the importance of developing those with people that you trust well in advance of when you absolutely need them in a crisis. Yeah, and we've, we've certainly heard that a lot from the SMI membership as well. That's, um, you know, the, the strategic, the places where they had strategic partnerships certainly did help, seem to help solve problems more quickly. So thank you. And Lisa, not, not to lean on you too much, but I'd like to start our first official question of the panel discussion today with you. Um, and I'd like to ask, as we look for, as we, um, Think about digging a little deeper. What's been your biggest, your company's biggest challenge um, during this COVID-19 crisis? And how has your organization addressed that challenge? And if Lisa, if you would take that one first for us, that would be great. So as I reflected on this, on this question, there's been, you know, a plethora, I suppose, of challenges that we and other distributors have faced um, and the providers have faced, um, more importantly. Um, for us, I think, if I boil it down, it's all about lack of supply, right? So lack of continuous supply and 
the lack of the data, the lack of the visibility of data on product availability and, and when it's going to be available. Um, we have, you know, as all distributors do, um, we have um, programs in place that help when things go on allocation so that we can give um, a fair amount of product to the to the customers, right? So that you don't allow anyone to kind of come in and take the whole, the whole um, breadth of product that's available. So it's a, a more fair and equitable distribution. And that's kind of in distribution, everyone kind of does that. But as we went into the pandemic, I think at one time we had over 11,000 items on allocation from suppliers. So that's a whole new level. I think before that, the most we had ever had was about 2,000. Um, so just managing that and then managing the data and the communication to the customers on what's available and how we can help them in crisis. So it's, it's managing that and then also managing which customers really were in need. So working with the federal government to understand you know, where those top 100 counties were every 96 hours, um, making sure we were getting um, applicable items to those providers so that they can provide patient care. So I think that's probably the thing that we struggle with the most is just lack of supply, lack of visibility to supply, um, and then just being able to, you know, I think distribution overall did, um, I call it move heaven and earth, trying to get the products that we did have available to the people that needed them the most. Um, and I compliment everybody on this phone because I was working with, you know, all of these companies through this process um, as we tried to respond in the best possibly, possible manner um, to support the providers and in the end, the patient care that um, was so desperately needed. So I think for us, um, that was probably the biggest challenge Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We, we keep hearing the, the data element come up again and again, and I think it's going to be something that SMI continues to focus on going forward as well. Mark, thoughts about the biggest challenge that Owens and Minor faced and how you dealt with it through this crisis? Yeah, so I, I, I struggled with this because there were, there were so many challenges, and, and Lisa <laughs> alluded to it. You know, we had teammate safety concerns. We had countries shutting down. We had custom hurdles, regulatory, shifting regulatory environment. We had FEMA adding complexity. We had the White House Supply Chain Task Force adding a whole new level of, of complexity. Uh, emergency use authorizations changing. We all dealt with suppliers coming out of the woodwork, and I'm using air quotes around the term suppliers, um, you know, with, with offers of product. We had fraudulent um, suppliers out there, if you will. Obviously, the demand spike, the pricing, the upfront payments to you know to get in line, if you will, um, you know for for supplemental product, um, you know, and another issue was with that sheer mass of suppliers coming through or or, or potential product, you know, there's in certain countries, and it's I'm not passing judgment, it's it's literally a sport to defeat the regulatory standards of other countries. And, and so we really had to get beyond marketing literature, right? And, and do, do manufacturer inspections on the ground in, in, in foreign countries um, to, to really validate and understand some of these suppliers. Um, and then the manufacturer operational challenges, right? That were creating kind of a snow, snowball effect. And, and in any one, any one of these you can address or maybe two or three, but all of this was happening at the same time. And so the, the complexity was well beyond any, anyone who's been in the industry, we've been through pandemics, right? And, and so we've seen these before, but nothing, of course, like this one. And so how we got through it was really, um, you know, the standard kind of war room um, connectivity and all hands, on, all hands on deck. And the first and foremost was teammate safety. We have over 10,000 employees that manufacture product. Um, you know, so we had to make sure that they were going to be okay to get to get PPE out. Um, we had product allocation protocols um, for sure, uh, and and we sort of started at 100 percent of historical volume was the the allocation. Granted, that wasn't enough, but we wanted to make sure that our customers could at least rely on a certain amount of product for sure, and then we'd work on supplemental. Um, as a manufacturer, that's also um, you know uh, in this industry. Um, we ramped up product and, and production. We added shifts. We restarted idle production lines. We were fortuitous in that we were adding um, raw material capacity for the fabric that goes into the gowns and then 95s actually before all this happened. And that came online in the first quarter. So we were able to, able to take advantage of those resources right away. 
And then from a perspective of ensuring delivery, our distribution centers were operating 24 seven into the hotspots. And so we actually brought teammates in from, from areas of the country that weren't impacted to supplement those, those local workforces to make sure we had all hands on deck. And then lastly, our home health business was really focused on making sure that patients that get product at home could stay at home and get their product. And so that involved working with their insurance plans as needed and making sure that they got um, everything that, that's required. And is working with insurance plans, Mark, something that you all typically do, or was that something over and above? Yeah, fortunately, I get to avoid that one. Uh, <laughs> but the, the Byram team is, is really skilled at that, and so they were able to, to, to work through it. And, um, it was not a small task. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Thank you. And Rob, your thoughts on the biggest challenge that your organization faced during COVID-19 and how you have worked to address it? Yeah, sure. And, and like Lisa and Mark, uh, it, it was a, a slew of challenges all coming at the same time and the same challenges that, that they highlighted. But as Mark said, first and foremost, it came uh, down to, to focusing on our teammates. And we instantly, overnight, um, moved thousands of office employees uh, to work from home where they remain today and will remain for many months so that only essential employees were at our site so that we could uh, establish safety protocols and protect those 10,000 employees that we have at our domestic manufacturing and distribution facilities. So first and foremost, we took care of that. We took care of that immediately. And we've been able to continue to manufacture and distribute product, uh, not without challenges, of course, but I've uh, been, been able to do that um, very, very successfully throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, you know, secondly, I'd highlight uh, communication and transparency. That's been really important for us, whether we're communicating with employees or um, partners or customers uh, or, or our partners in the government, really uh, maintaining that transparency and communication, uh, especially as it related to allocation. Transparency for allocation for us is, is key, really focusing on under-promising and over-delivering so that our customers could make the business decisions that they needed to to adjust to the reality of, of allocation. And our allocation, I think Lisa mentioned this as well, really focused on uh, treating all existing customers equally in, in a predictable uh, manner. So really focused on that transparency and communication in terms of allocation. We were fortunate in that we were able to relatively quickly stabilize our supply chain, uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, while certainly we weren't able to keep up with exponential demand increases in every category, we, we were quickly able to, across the board, produce more product and deliver more product than pre-COVID levels. And you know, achieving that stability and getting that uh, product as quickly as possible to uh, the front lines was was really um, challenging, uh, but really uh, um, important and uh, something that we were able to really uh, excel at. And part of that goes back to those existing relationships that Lisa mentioned. We uh, partnered very, very closely with the U.S. government to solve all of the various challenges domestically and internationally that we ran into as we worked through uh, quarantine restrictions and movement restriction orders and import and export restrictions and regulatory hurdles, all of the things that came at us uh, that Mark alluded to that came at us simultaneously, really working uh, with our existing relationships with our customers, with our, uh, our government partners to be able to uh, work through each and every one of those challenges. And I'll just, in, in closing, I'll just tie it back to that point I made at the onset that supply chain diversification is, was really key here. Certainly throughout the, the pandemic, we've ran into challenges in one market or another or in one region or another, but because we have a diverse supply chain that relies on domestic and international production on, on production across the, the, the globe, as we ran into a challenge on one, uh, at, at, in one country or region and worked through that for um, as quickly as possible, product continued to flow from uh, the other regions that we were relying on for those same types of products. And that diversification and redundancy in our supply chain really helped us uh, stabilize uh, as quickly as possible and deliver as much product as possible to uh, healthcare providers as, uh, you know, as, as fast as possible. Yeah, and stability certainly is the, the word of the day. We're all aiming for that, I think, and trying to stabilize as much as possible as things go forward. So thank you for that. 
Um, Jean, I'd like to turn to you now and maybe shift the discussion a little bit to talk about what your organization is doing now and what you're planning to do in the future as we prepare for, you know, what we all know will probably be additional pandemics and other crises coming down the road. So just some insight and any thoughts you have to share on the previous question about your biggest challenge, but also um, share with us what you're doing now and what you're planning to do going forward as an organization. Thank you, Nancy. And, uh... We are extremely proud of McKesson's response, but also understand that this is really dynamic and the crisis is still with us, continues to evolve. We continue to learn, change, and adapt every day. Um, when I think about the challenges, they, they build on the themes of what we heard from the other speakers. You know, our early focus uh, was on our associates and our customers. I was reminded recently that the last time we had our entire distribution leadership team physically together in one place was back on March 11th and 12th. And many of us were out to dinner on March 11th when the news of the NBA canceling their season broke. And I think at that moment, it became real that this was going to be different and we were gonna to have to operate differently. You know, we adjusted our agenda for the next day and it all became about drafting a playbook that had never been drafted before. And we aligned around three pillars. Those pillars continue to guide us today. And that was around keeping our employees safe, keeping our facilities open and operating, and making sure that we would be there to service and support our customers. We did many of the things we heard from Mark and the others. You know, we implemented extreme physical distancing. <laughs> and that was a choice because we value our culture and we wanted our people to be social but we understood that we had to change the layout, the schedule, the staffing, our cleaning protocols. As soon as we could secure it, we issued PPE, we adopted a face covering policy, temperature screenings, and right now we're in the middle of providing flu vaccines to all of our associates across our 40 distribution locations. And, and not everything has gone perfectly, but we've uh, communicated openly and transparently and frequently as much as we can. And we're proud of the fact that we've continued to operate 24 seven in places that experience you know, significant events of COVID-19. The focus of the organization right now is largely around vaccine distribution. And we are extremely humbled and honored to be building on our longstanding and successful partnership with the CDC to play the role of the centralized distributor of vaccines and ancillary kits. Uh, it is an extreme honor and an awesome responsibility that the complete resources of McKesson are being put behind. And when I think about ways that we continue to evolve, maybe there's two that, that I'll highlight. One is around different ways that we're using our people and teams, and one is a way that we're using data and technology. In the early days of the crisis, we knew that we were gonna have to think and act differently. And we quickly stood up what we call our critical care drug task force team. And this is comprised of supply chain and procurement specialists married together with clinicians and pharmacists that were looking at the evolvement treatment protocols and demands and beginning to think through not only first, but second, third, and even fourth line agents. They were proactive with our customers, you know, having conversations around patient load, demand, trends, the inventory that was on hand in those facilities, and then we were able to be responsive by kind of moving, staging, securing inventory in the right places at the right time. The team served as kind of a centralized hub for communications and data. And we're still convening that day, that team today, monitoring what's happening in communities across the country. And we believe it has significantly influenced the way we think, the way we act, and the way we believe what is possible. And the second example is around kind of infrastructure and data. We've heard a common theme through many of the answers around partnership. And when I think back to the early days of this crisis, when there were more questions than answers, and when people were, you know, scared and uncertain, you know, the customer experience was really driven by those that would be transparent with us. And I think a great example is the relationship that we have with Ascension Health. We're proud to have great partners like Ascension that collaborate with us on new solutions. And in response to the historical challenges of supply availability and product shortages, we made investments in sequestration programs. And Ascension was an early adopter of those tools. But I think the pandemic really heightened and brought to light how important those proactive and dynamic inventory management solutions were. And by leveraging them, we were able to give our customers confidence that additional supply would be available without having to make the investment or bearing the burden or the complexity of physical on-site inventory storage. 
as we think about responding to you know, changing legislations and national stockpiles and stockpiling requirements, these are the kind of tools that are gonna make that possible. And as I said in my opening comments about the learnings, you know, mutual success, I think, is driven by the partnership and relationships matter. And I think we heard from some of the speakers about those proactive relationships before the really needing and building on trust. And I know all of the colleagues on the panel today, you know, want to be at the table with our customers. Uh, most likely, we want to be on the same side of the table, you know, leaning into these challenges together and thinking about the solutions that are going to be needed. Excellent. And it sounds like you're building some of those customer relationships even now um, before things get more difficult again. Excellent. We're not, on, we're not on our way out of this? Is that what you're saying? I, I wish we were. Um, Ty, your thoughts on, on what you're going to be doing differently now and in the future relative to this crisis at, at Henry Schein? No, I, I, I can't speak immediately to that without mentioning, you know, the, the first topic, which was one of the things that, that we, we went through as an organization, like every organization represented here today, was really now in, moving to a virtual work environment. And when you look at the size of the organizations and what it took to be able to, you know, mobilize and operationalize strategy to get to strategies to get that many team members, you know, to experience and adapt to a new way of, of communicating and working together um, was very unique for us. And, and so, you know, as we navigated that in the early months of, of COVID, really started allowing us to start building on the foundation of where we really wanted to focus you know, throughout the rest of 2020. And it was really around two, two centralized themes of, of rebuilding and reimagining. And so when we look at rebuilding, you know, a lot of organizations that we work with, you know, unfortunately it are, had just stopped seeing patients and stopped, you know, with procedures. And so we had to be able to help, help them to restart their business. We start, you know, from a, a patient perspective as well as, you know, cases and things along those lines. And so, you know, with the, surge of, of telehealth and virtual health care delivery models that were implemented, um, you know, for us, it opened up a number of different opportunities of, of where we see our business and how we reimagine, you know, the rest of, of these changes going into effect throughout the rest of 2020 and, and beyond. Um, so, you know, I, some of the things that we're looking at from an organizational perspective is how do we, how do we take the information, whether it be allocations and processes that were mentioned by some of the other panelists, but getting the information directly, you know, into our customers' hands. Um, you know, major investments in our e-commerce platforms to be able to take this information and provide it to them, you know, on demand, so they can be able to look to see for themselves exactly, you know, certain product categories that were in high demand and start to see exactly, you know, what these allocation processes look like. So, um, more investments in the transparency and aspects that all support you know, that was certainly empowering in an area that we, we certainly need to, to begin to move. And we're going to continue to see investments in, in telehealth and virtual care visits and reimagining how delivery of care has, has changed throughout this. So certainly going to have an impact on our strategies moving forward. Yeah, excellent point. And then the transparency seems to be a theme that, um, you know, we're all repeating and we've heard rep repeated over and over again. I know it's something that our provider members are eager to increase the transparency of what they can see and provide and um, supplier and, and distributor partners as well. So thank you. Robert, your thoughts on what you're doing differently now at Cardinal and what you're going to be doing differently in the future and any thoughts on the, um, the question about uh, insight on, on what your experience was as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's been unprecedented time for, for all of us. I think we'd agree. I, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, we at Cardinal Health really worked with a few key goals in mind, uh, and then I'll talk about how we've learned and adapted that. But uh, number one was really enacting our emergency business continuity plans right off the bat. I think it was Gene that mentioned that March 11th date. I remember I was in Dublin, Ohio with our leadership team as well, and, and a very similar type of reaction and response to really change the course of what we had planned for the rest of that week and really jump into what we didn't know would be um, how, how long and intense this would be going forward. Um, you know, we also moved quickly to increase our manufacturing output. We, we knew that was something early on. I think we, we knew we would need to do both for our Cardinal brand products, uh, but also our distribution capacity, thinking about the stress we would start to see on the system. And then partnering with our national brand partners, right? As a manufacturer and a distributor, our national brand partners are critical in terms of making sure 
uh, we can collectively service uh, our customers uh, with the, with the products they need to serve patients. So, you know, a few specific examples. We we expanded uh, existing and non-traditional manufacturing capabilities to ramp up production of PPE. I think that was certainly something earlier in the spring that uh, we heard about in the news broadly, right, as a collective industry, as well as new entrants doing that. We stood up a new facility within a few weeks um, and are actually adding a second in North America to expand production of certain PPE categories. Uh, and even some examples of innovation driven by, you know, some of our uh, ground level manufacturing employees. Um, you know, we, we decreased the, the tie length on our facial mask by three to four inches, something that seems pretty like a mundane type of change and maybe not something that, that we would have thought about, but um, in, in leadership, but from a ground level perspective, that allowed us to increase monthly production by over 2 million uh, from a unit perspective. So different innovations like that, I think it was a collective effort, kind of the, the all hands in approach to do that. Um, I would also mention expanding our supplier relationships, um, expanding those you know, beyond just our national brand relationships, but to look at others. And I think it was Mark that mentioned, you know, kind of with the air, air quote reference to suppliers, we certainly experienced something similar in terms of having to vet hundreds of inbound supplier opportunities. And most of our organizations represented in this panel have resources on the ground to do some more diligence. And what, what we try to do is share some of those insights from our sourcing diligence team uh, with GPOs, with uh, our customers, so they could help filter and triage uh, the influx of requests they were getting themselves, because in many cases, they didn't um, necessarily have the resources to do that. Um, in terms of going forward, you know, we're really, there's been a lot of learnings, and I, it's great to see a lot of um, similarity in terms of themes from the rest of the panel, because I think that signals good things for the industry as we're moving forward. Um, you know, we're certainly continuing to expand total manufacturing capacity. Uh, we're looking at additional options in, in um, North America and elsewhere. We're also working with customers and partners on appropriate opportunities to shift reliance on just-in-time inventory. There's uh, certainly an importance to that. There's a reason that that's an attractive option now, but I think uh, to one of the earlier comments, remembering you know, the, the stresses on the system that some of these recent events have imposed, do we need to rebalance that? Uh, and then finally, last couple of points, I would say optimizing our replenishment network to really get product closer to our forward DCs, right? To enable rapid replenishment and be more agile. Um, you know, this is obviously a national pandemic. In the future, there may be more regionalized uh, disruptions in supply uh, that we want to be prepared for. Uh, and then finally, building capacity in a central U.S. location to manage customer-owned pandemic inventory. That's something we've seen a large increase in demand and interest from, from our customers. And that's something that we've been, we've been moving forward with. So certainly a lot of, lot of learnings that we'll continue to incorporate into our business practice. Wonderful. Um, yeah, we've all, we've all learned a lot. And um, I think we've all learned how to pivot quickly. That's certainly been my big takeaway. And it sounds like you all um, had the same kind of experience. Christine, I think we do have a couple of questions for the panel, so I'm going to interrupt my questioning and take up a question or two from the audience, if you can help us with that. Yeah, we do. Uh, Nancy, our first question asks, what are you hearing from your customers in terms of their plans in a post-COVID-19 environment? And based on this feedback, are you anticipating changes in how a distributor works with customers? So I'm going to make this in the old game show tradition a toss-up question. Who would like to uh, to start by taking that question on what the, the sort of the customers are saying and how they're looking for distributors to behave in a post-COVID world? Yes. Mark. Yeah, I can I can just take a, a quick swing. So it it really is about so I think it was Robert that mentioned early on data, right? And so just being much more transparent with our with our incoming supply. Um, where is it in the process? If, what are the early warning indicators that there's a problem? And, and then work together to, to make sure we mitigate those. And I'd say the, the additional piece is the, the uh, diversification. So having more than one product approved for certain applications, right? Have those value analysis teams 
um, working in, in coordination with the distribution team because the distributors have access to a really broad set of products. And so let's, let's enable that and, and just be, again, very transparent around identification of what those key products are and have alternatives set and just be very open about you know, where they're coming from and where they are in the supply chain when, when the orders are coming. Anyone else want to take a stab at that question yeah, that's the, from the customer perspective? Yeah, I can add a little bit of clarity as well from our perspective. Um, you know, voice of customer has been a, a major priority for us. And when we launched our rebuilding and reimagining programs, you know, getting the feedback from our customers was extremely important for us. And, and I would say one of the biggest areas that, um, you know, that, that we found beneficial in gaining that insight was really in demand planning. Um, so when we really focus on what the demand is and really understanding what was driving a lot of the demand, it really helps us understand, you know, from a supply chain perspective where we need to make improvements. So, you know, incorporating that into the conversations has been extremely insightful that's come from the feedback we've received from customers. Wonderful. Anyone else have comments about the customer perspective? I think the only thing that I would add is adding on to it, I think it was Robert's statement on um, pandemic supply and customers really building stockpiles um, and the need for that and how distribution can be partners in that process and ensuring that the product stays fresh and it's available. And so I've, we've heard a lot of conversation around that, but I would echo Mark and Ty's comments. Um, they're spot on exactly what we're hearing as well from customers, diversification, making sure that they have ample supply um, even diversification um, down to country of origin on supplies. Um, so there's going to be, I think, a press for, for clear and, and concise data on, on that um, from, the, from the industry. Um, so I, I would concur with, with those comments. Excellent, thank you. Christine, any other questions before we move on to our next question in the, the panel discussion? We do, we have one more question, Nancy, so far, and it's, um, how did you empower your team members, the people on the front lines, to keep morale going during the during the crisis? Jean, Robert, or Rob, do you want to take this since the other three took the first question? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a shot, and I'm sure, sure others can add on. You know, I think it was around the communication, um, to be transparent, to be humble, to be empathetic, and, and being aware that every one of our associates is also a human that was dealing with this crisis and things outside of work as schools were getting closed and the uncertainty and the anxiety that everyone was feeling and creating the space to have those conversations and then also providing some resources to help those that are our most essential and often our most vulnerable, you know, navigate and deal with what was being forced upon them. Um, you know, I think that is in our cultures uh, you know, of I care and I lead, and we were able to lean on those during these most difficult times. Yeah, I would just echo that. We uh, went through a very similar experience, and I, I would just add to it, one of the things, we brought a lot of expertise to the table. We consulted a lot of expert, uh, experts as we worked through uh, our, our plan to protect our team members at our various sites, but we were also flexible and nimble and took feedback uh, and humble throughout the process, took feedback from the employees, adjusted as uh, we learned new and better ways of, uh, of managing through the crisis. And, and that feedback loop and that engagement from the employees and, and incorporating their feedback into a new and even better ways uh, of managing through the crisis, I think really helped us uh, manage the employee experience. Wonderful. What brief comment I would add, I would certainly echo and reinforce what Jean and, and Rob mentioned. One un unanticipated um, byproduct, I think, was the morale and engagement of our team members, and I'm guessing it was similar with my colleagues here, was so energized by the sense of mission of what we were doing, right? So I think the, the morale piece was around making sure you know, everyone working from home environment, I think we're all experiencing, it's hard to see the delineation between when am I working and when am I not, and making sure, and for all of us, right, it was 24 seven for months at a time to make sure people felt empowered to take that time away, even if it might be take Sunday off so you can come back and, and be strong for your customers. But the issue we were trying to manage is having our employees turn off a little bit because they were mm -hmm. so um, empowered by the critical role we all play in this. 
Yeah, very good point. I, I, I would say that it, it has probably accelerated a, a, a hypersensitivity to behavioral and mental health for a lot of organizations, right? And, and this was a way in which it, it, you know, the simple reaching out on a weekly basis in a virtual way, um, you know, to ensure that, that everyone was doing well and, and managing through it was really, really important to improve on that. But I, I do think, you know, it was easy for us to focus on PPE and items that are right there in front of us, right? But this is an aspect that, that certainly for our employees benefits that we need to continue to remain hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question for some of our panelists and I'd like to start with you, Lisa, taking it to a more global sort of perspective. And I know you've done some work with the Strategic National Stockpile as I'm sure all of your organizations have. What should the healthcare industry as a whole be doing differently based on this experience? We're, we're, what are kind of the, the changes we need to see happen fairly quickly as we're moving forward? So I think, you know, healthcare as a whole I think it goes back to things that we've already talked about and it's data and it's clear and concise communication. So it still astounds me that Walmart can trace a contaminated batch of spinach back to the farm, the exact farm that that product was located or produced in. And yet we, we don't have that in healthcare to that level. So I think this puts um, that in the forefront to not only um, for you know, recalls and challenges, but also for as you know, borders close, or we have a global pandemic, or we have a hurricane that wipes out Puerto Rico. I mean, those are all things that we, you know, I feel like nature or God or the universe continues to try to teach us the lesson, um, and we don't, seem to, we don't seem to change. So I, I really think that just that clear and concise data demand planning from, from you know, raw material to production to distribution into the supply chain and having that um, open platform with, you know, built with a lot of trust um, throughout the healthcare supply chain can make us more efficient. It can make um, product, um, you know, safer, obviously better patient care. Um, and, it, and it just provides such a level of knowledge that is so vastly needed in healthcare today. Um, and then just making sure that that partnership, both with the private sector and the, and the public sector, um, continues. I think um, we've done a lot of work as an industry to um, shore up those relationships, as I spoke earlier, about um, having strategic relationships and partnerships. And we've done a lot of work with the government, as everyone on this, on this panel has, and, and I'm sure there's providers as well. Um, but to make sure that we do have those partnerships in place so that um, I, I feel like the industry came together pretty quickly and, and was able to provide some resources to the federal government. But how do we get in front of that? And how do we develop a strategic national stockpile that can use really the private public partnership to make sure that the product is always available and it is always and it's available, um, you know, in a in a demand planning scenario, so not a push scenario as it is today. Um, so the product just gets pushed to the healthcare. Um, it's got to get better. Um, I, and with the technology today, there's no reason it can't. Um, and I think with some really good, um, there's a lot of smart people in this industry. And I think together we can all um, help in both of those avenues. So it's really about demand planning, making sure that we have clear and concise communication and visibility up and down the supply chain and then also a robust um, uh, infrastructure with our federal partners to make sure that um, if something like this happens again or a natural uh, disaster or um, a myriad of things, that we're prepared and that we have the resources and training and we're ready to, to move and operationalize uh, even quicker than we did here. Exactly, exactly. And I know, Lisa, you're, you've been instrumental um, with our, our initiative team that's looking at the strategic national stockpile and helping to connect SMI and our members to hopefully take on some kind of an advisory role with that group to, to do exactly the kinds of things that you're talking about. So thank you for those comments. Mark, comments on what you think the industry should be doing differently going forward? Yeah, so a couple of things. You know, if we think about our fundamental mission, it's really about continuity supply, right? Getting the getting the products to the patients and clinicians in the most efficient manner possible. I mean, that, that's really the fundamental mission. And, and we need to capture the learnings from the last several months and the months to come 
and embed that into our standard work. So, that, so you know, we shouldn't have an initiative <laughs> around supply continuity. It's got to be built into our standard work, built into our processes, and built into everything that we do. And we've got to really assess that supply risk with, with, with vigor, right? So country of origin kind of risk assessments. Frankly, even, you know, made in America doesn't mean that we don't have a, have a, a supply risk, but there can be components of these products, right, that, that are reliant on, um, on other parts of the world that have a, a riskier kind of profile. And so it's, it's getting even beyond understanding country of origin and understanding what the manufacturer is doing, what the distributor is doing to mitigate that risk. And, and it's, it's getting to a, a level of depth that, you know, Lisa alluded to it. It's prevalent in other industries, but, but it's not as prevalent in, um, you know, in, in healthcare. And, and when we're getting products that are sourced, you know, where does it come from? Do the, the companies that manufacture the product, do they support the values of your organization, whether it's business practices or human rights or environmental compliance, because we've seen that create disruption in the market as well, you know, as, as well. So, you know, I think it's, it's about embodying these learnings. Don't treat them as an initiative. This is, this is a new way of doing business. And we've just got to really shift our thinking back to that fundamental mission, which is just make sure every time we get product to the clinicians and, and the patients being served. Yep, that's how that's I think, a, how get, I think. Getting, focusing on the on the basics, right? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. Excellent. And Rob, thoughts on the, the healthcare industry as a whole and what we can do differently. Yeah, I think Mark and Robert have mentioned this, but I, I think it starts with committing this to our long-term memory, not forgetting uh, the experience that we've gone through these past few months and for the foreseeable future, uh, but also not recognizing that this could happen again, this will happen again, but also recognizing that it likely won't take the same shape in the same form and that we need to prepare in a way that uh, enables us to be nimble and flexible uh, and uh, adjust to a, a different set of circumstances in the next um, uh, pandemic or supply chain uh, uh, challenges that we're inevitably going to face. And so some, some themes that I think resonate regardless of what that next challenge is, uh, sustained collaboration is, is a good starting point. Uh, you know, across the industry with our with our partners throughout the continuum of care, but also uh, with our government partners as well. And I think we've made uh, we I think Lisa mentioned that how quickly we were able to pull together as an industry and and collaborate with the U.S. government and really help to uh, to to help in in the response. And it hasn't gone flawlessly for sure, but uh, we were able to make a lot of progress more or less instantaneously. But what if next time we didn't have to start from scratch? What if uh, we we could really lay a found, use the foundation that's been formed through this crisis to prepare us for the next crisis and have that really sustained collaboration and that sustained transparency? And you know, I've already mentioned supply chain diversification in terms of country of origin, uh, in terms of redundancy uh, built into the supply chain, um, the the importance of of stockpiling at the um, at the federal government level, at the state government level, at the provider level, healthcare system level, for distributors and manufacturers as well, really just across the board, more um, attention, more uh, uh, commitment to uh, preparedness and recognizing that the next situation might will inevitably be different and that we, we have to kind of think through that scenario and uh, have a response that enables us to be nimble and flexible. Yep, we're, hear we're hearing those words a lot, nimble and flexible. I think between that and pivot, those are our new watchwords, right? Um, Gene, I'd, I'd like to start with you on our next question and think about specifically, because this audience is manufacturers, distributors, part providers all together, and we are SMI working together to really transform healthcare. So think about what can manufacturers and providers do to support all of you, the distributors? What is it that, that they can do differently um, that maybe we haven't talked about yet today that will help contribute to improved, um, improved, this improved supply chain across healthcare? I mean, it, it, it might stump me a little bit with something that we haven't talked about already. You know, I, I think it really is you know, the themes of partnership and transparency, you know, 
we, I spoke a lot about downstream with our customers, but the same exists upstream with our manufacturer partners. And to the extent, you know, appropriate and allowable, you know, I think it was Robert's comments about across with our other distributor stakeholders. Um, you know, as I think back to kind of mid-March and early April, uh, I, I want to be, you know, careful in that being sensitive to the fact that everybody's experience was a little bit different. And I think there was a distinction between PPE and pharmaceuticals in how the supply chain reacted and responded. You know, there are many more significant gates around pharmaceuticals than there are PPE. Um, but the demand and the spike in demand in a really compressed amount of time was unprecedented. And I think it's been well documented and well reported. And when we speak about pharmaceuticals, there was significantly more supply in the channel in the weeks following that spike. Now, not every order was filled 100%. But, you know, we really struggled to make a distinction between what was anticipatory demand as providers were appropriately thinking about what they might see and worst case scenarios and making sure that they were well prepared and what was true patient need. And the more we got visibility to that, and I spoke earlier about the drug task force, and we were able to share that information upstream with our manufacturer partners. And I remember very detailed conversations with Pfizer and Fresenius and Hikma, you know, where we had specifics on items and dosage and forms and volumes in the channel and timeline and patient lead, we were able to secure additional inventory and surge that in to hotspots where it was needed most. You know, I think we also heard from many of the panel participants that you know, our historical allocation methods, which was based upon information we have, which is largely order volume, proved insufficient because we were seeing unprecedented order volume from places and on items that were really unique. Um, so getting visibility into that and getting better forward-looking insights and triggers, which exist a little bit in the retail channel, but maybe not as much in the provider and the health system channel. And the, the better that we can share, and it's that theme of data and information, the better prepared we will be. Um, you know, and again, yeah. we've heard from all the panel participants about our commitment to patient care. You know, I, I think we, we fully understand that you cannot deliver care as a provider unless we deliver as a distributor. And that connection and that shared mission is hopefully what we can continue to build on going forward. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. And Ty, your thoughts on, you know, manufacturers and, and providers and what they can do differently to help you as a distributor. Yeah, I think, you know, clarity and collaboration. I mean, Gene hit on some, some comments. I mean, that I'll, I'll certainly share those thoughts and echo those as well. But um, when you look at the partnerships, let's say right in the, in the thick, uh, at the height of the, the supply and demand issues that we were all facing. We, we, were, we were in this together, right? And so we were, you know, trying our very best to source new products to prevent fraud from happening, you know, where it was just abundantly occurring all over the place. And so, you know, I, I would say that the communication in certain areas with the manufacturer, with the provider, looking at vetting out opportunities where we could find them, you know, it was, you know, the, the level of transparency and then be able to say, look, we, we can't provide this at this time, right? Or these particular manufacturers are coming saying, you know, we just, we simply can't allow any more allocation of this product. Um, it certainly allowed us all to be in there together, right? So we're all rowing in the same direction, recognizing that, okay, well now let's, let's focus our efforts elsewhere. And so I think a lot of those conversations, you know, certainly were important to understand that there, you know, wasn't a winner or a loser in that particular situation, right? But that we were fighting you know, for that common good. So I would, I would continue to reinforce the need for that. You know, there's opportunities where our sourcing team was able to work with some of our provider sourcing teams as well. Just let them know we had already vetted out certain organizations for a variety of perspectives, right? So to Gene's comment, taking that clinical aspect into mind to recognize, you know, we, we passed on this particular product for these reasons, allowed some of our customers to make some informed decisions that they otherwise would have spent a lot of time trying to trace down themselves. So can they continue to, to reinforce the need for clarity and collaboration? 
Thank you. I think I think there's some key words that will kind of come out of this, which we all have heard many times, but data, transparency, collaboration, communication, um, they seem so simple and yet they're so critical and so so hard sometimes to really turn into action. But Robert, I don't want to slight you at all and make sure you have a chance to comment on this question of what manufacturers and, and providers can do to really support the distributor community as we look to the future. Absolutely. I'll, I'll briefly touch on the manufacturer piece, but I think my comments there would echo a lot of what Ty and Jean mentioned, and that is just to say uh, proactive is maybe the word I'd add to communications, mm -hmm. but proactive communication, uh, because it's not a question of will there be disruptions in the future. Of course, we're all working to minimize those, but it, it's when they will happen, how widespread will they be? And in those cases, um, we generally, there, if we were open and transparent with data, we can see them coming. And so what can we do to create contingency plans and solve for those? So I think that's, that's the biggest one from a manufacturer perspective. You know, we've developed a new supplier scorecard. So we work with our manufacturing partners and really uh, try to build some seamless integration with our data to do that going forward. So um, credit to all the manufacturers on, on this call for I know what, what you've done with, with us and with others. With the providers, I would say uh, partner on demand planning, right? Again, forward looking visibility. We don't have the best insight, as I think Gene mentioned. Prior order volume is not a good correlate necessarily for what it will look like going forward. I mean, we're kind of at an inflection point with this, so, um, or a turning point with the pandemic. So we need that. Um, the other point I would say, we haven't talked a ton about this today, is, is to the providers developing a predefined pandemic formulary, right? We talk about diversification from a supplier perspective to minimize risk, but I also think there's a lot of providers that are questioning long held assumptions around, hey, maybe I couldn't in the past refine a list of this many SKUs down to a, a smaller number. And now they're saying I was forced to do it through the pandemic and maybe I can just stay, uh, hold, hold that going forward without any clinical compromise, of course, but with operational strength coming out of it and efficiency. So mm -hmm. something that um, I would just, obviously that's for providers to consider, but I've been hearing that consistently from a lot of customers uh, that their willingness and eagerness to do that. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm glad that the customers are um, looking differently as well. I'm sure we're all looking differently across the industry. Well, we are at the top of the hour just about, and I just want to thank all of you for participating in this discussion. I think it's been a tremendous um, sharing of thoughts and ideas, and I know our audience has really valued getting perspective across the board from such a wide um, variety of voices in the distribution marketplace. So thank you very much for being a part of this discussion today. Um, Alex, I think we have one slide just to remind everybody what other programs SMI has coming up. Um, we do have our SMI University program coming up in, in uh, uh, next October 21st, next Wednesday. Uh, that's for our emerging leaders and SMI members. And we'll have Jim Francis and Susan Lewis talking about building career success. Then we have a speed networking event, which is our exciting new one-to-one um, -one networking. We're using Zoom in a different way, and we'd love to have all of you um, SMI members only participate in the speed networking event. And then we have an educational leadership series, the next in our educational leadership series program. Uh, we've got uh, Brandy Greenberg, the Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare with the advisory board with a couple of folks from her team talking about time for a supply chain revolution. So I think it'll play nicely on the discussion that we've had today and what kinds of changes we wanna see coming out that the advisory board is really seeing and recommending come out of this pandemic. So again, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your taking time out of what we know is a very busy schedule these days and sharing your thoughts and ideas. And I know that our audience really valued hearing your perspectives. Thank you, everyone.